I enjoyed the Olympics. There was a few things I didn't get to see. We only have basic cable, so we don't have all the things and stuff. And didn't have all the extra channels. And Alyssa did a lot of watching of the, uh, the uh, trampoline events. Did you know there's trampoline events in the Olympics? Um, and, but they're so cool, yeah. she said. I didn't get to see them. But there's, they do all kinds of flips and all kinds of stuff on trampolines. But one of the neatest events for me was the synchronized diving. I've always thought the synchronized swimming was kind of cheeky. I mean, it's just cheesy. And no, no offense to those of you that love it, but it just oh. But the synchronized diving, man, men's synchronized diving was absolutely incredible. And there, there were two divers from the US one, if Tim were to stand beside me, he'd look like Tim and me. I mean, they, they, they're not near the same height. There's like an eight inch height difference. And synchronized diving, you gotta stay together. And they nailed it. And I believe we got the silver. Did they get gold? I thought they got the gold. Anyway, in the interview afterwards, these two young men showed their face so beautifully. How many of you saw it? Where they said, they said something. I had, I tried to capture it and be able to play it for you. I wasn't able to do that. But he, he, they were asked about how do you, you know, with all this going on around you, how do you focus? He goes, well, you know, with everything going on, everything coming at me, if my identity was in diving, I, I would lose it. But my identity isn't in diving; it's in Christ. Wow. I am here as a representative. of because my identity is in Christ. That was the most impressive moment. And there were others where people gave testimony. The, the gymnast, what's her name? The, huh? Simone Biles. Simone Biles. Wasn't it Simone Biles that gave, gave testimony to, to Jesus Christ or what gave glory to God? I, just, just fantastic. Finding our identity in who he is, not in who we are, the things we've achieved. These guys could be proud of what they accomplished. I mean, what they did took a lot of hard work, hours and hours and hours doing it over and over and over again. I, I don't know. I'm not sure I could be that dedicated to one thing. You know, go, going up the stairs and typing, going up the stairs and typing, going up over and over till it's right every time. Till they they they're 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 functioning as one person as they die. It's just unbelievable to me. Our identity is in Jesus Christ. Because of the grace of God on our lives. Ephesians, Paul said. We already, we already looked at this when we went through Ephesians. Paul said, for by grace you have been saved to me. Our salvation, our identity in Christ is because of God's grace. We died with him, Paul said. So I have to tell you that even though I'm not a woman, I have the right to change my mind. And instead of going through 2 Corinthians like I had planned, I struggled through this this week and decided that I want to take you through the book of Romans. The book of Romans is so pivotal in our understanding of our identity in Christ and who Christ is and our place in... Wow, thank you. All of a sudden, you can hear me. Our, our understanding of salvation, our... Where do you take someone who you are leading to Christ? What, what, what do we call it? The Romans Road. Much of the time we go to the Romans Road. Why? Because the book of Romans is all about establishing our depravity, our need for salvation. That's the first part. And then God's provision of salvation and how it works and so forth. So I have often, I've taught through Romans multiple times. Don, Don was saying, I, it hasn't been that long since I taught through Romans in, was it Wednesday night or Sunday school? Wednesday night. Wednesday night. But I, it is, huh? Back it's been, it's been a, a little while. 
but I haven't preached through it in over 10 years. And teaching and preaching are two different avenues of discussion. And so I wanted to take the time to preach through the book of Romans. And we're just going to handle the first seven verses this morning. And, yeah, this morning, I said it again. I tell you, folks, we have to go back to a morning service just for my sanity. <laughs> this is not a discussion time, Lee. This is me preaching, and so we need to cut that out. <laughs> Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Let's just stop there for just a moment if I can get this thing. Paul's identi identity in Jesus Christ is the, the, the idea of a bond servant. There were millions of slaves in the Roman world in that day. It was not uncommon for a person to be sold into slavery to pay debt. The, that was normal practice. However, when a person that had been a slave <coughs> came to the place that their debt had been paid off, and that did happen, and there were laws protecting that, many times you found this person not having any other means of income, having become part of the family they were a slave in, and that person had the right, by their own decision, to become a bond slave or a bond servant. They would choose to stay as a servant in that home. That person would then have their ear pierced. Several of you knew that already. To signify that they were there by their own choice. When Paul says, I'm a bond slave, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, He's saying, I am placing myself under Christ of my own volition because of what Christ did for me. He was a citizen of Rome. He was born in the city of Tarsus. Highly educated. Tarsus was known for its university. Paul studied at the Gamaliel for his, for his religious training, but he may have also had much more training than that because of where he came from. As a citizen of Rome, he was a citizen, he was a servant to no man. In fact, if we as we look back at the book of Acts, when Paul was arrested in the temple and he came up to the steps, he identified himself as a citizen of Rome, and the, the centurions changed how they were treating him. On his missionary journeys, a couple of times, Paul looked after being beaten and said, Is this how you treat a Roman citizen? And it put fear into their, the people that had, had punished him. Because they knew that as a citizen of Rome, they had to be very, very careful. Because Rome defended its citizens, unlike the United States. No, I'm just <laughs> not going to get political. Paul also knew that he had become a slave to Judaism. To the point where he persecuted the church. He wasn't a servant of Christ at that time. He was a persecutor of Christ. He was one who wanted to destroy the church and destroy Christianity and destroy the name of Christ. And yet he now calls himself a bondservant of Jesus Christ. His identity is now in Christ. He was called by Christ, called to be an apostle. He later in the book of Romans talks about the call, the effectual call of, of salvation. When did this happen? He was on the road to Damascus in Acts 9.15. The message I, I preach in, that I preached in the past about Romans 9, talk, I entitled Arrested. See, Paul went to arrest, but he was arrested. He was stopped in his tracks by God. And God commissioned him. God saved him and God commissioned him at the same moment. Paul's life took a 180. And God called him as an apostle. An apostle that was different from all of the rest. 
The other 11 apostles, or if you want to include Matthias, 12. I debated in my mind a lot whether Matthias is actually an apostle because in Revelation it talks about the 12 or the 13. So, I don't know. We'll find out when we get there. Um, but the other 11 were all the disciples of Christ that were, were part of that inner group. Paul says he was called as an apostle as one out of time, out of sync. He, he didn't walk with the Lord when he was on the earth. He saw the risen Lord later and was commissioned, a special commission. All of the other apostles <clears throat> were apostles mainly to the Jews. Now you say, no, Pastor Peter, Peter went to Cornelius. Yes, he did. And he did go to some of the Gentiles, but very few. They were apostles to the Jewish people. Paul and Paul alone was commissioned as the apostle to the Gentiles. And we say, praise God, because I'm a Gentile. I don't know about the rest of you. I've, I've looked at Samantha's DNA. She did her DNA a number of years ago. There's no Jew in her. Which means there's none in me, because if there was some in, in her, there'd have to be some as well. There could be some in me. But since there's none, there can't be. He says, I'm... I'm called as an apostle, separated, sanctified, set apart, made to have a special purpose. His one purpose in life was then the gospel. Euangelion is the Greek word for gospel. It simply means the two words, good news. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. It's the good news of God. What good news is that? That there's an answer to the sin problem. That there is a solution to the fact that we're sinners and that we're dying, spiritually dead and dying and going to a place called hell and the lake of fire. And there needs to be something done to change that. And the good news is Jesus did it. Amen? Amen. Jesus came dying on the cross. The fact of the, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ is the good news of God. And Paul says, I was separated. I was called. I was separated, set apart un amongst all the other apostles. I was set apart specially for this gospel of God to the Gentiles. <clears throat> he talks about the gospel. His message, he says, he says, uh, that gospel, which was promised beforehand, through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. What's he talking about? The entire Old Testament is pointing to Jesus Christ. In nearly every book of the Old Testament, if not every one, you can see the Messianic prophecies pointing to the good news coming, Jesus Christ coming, always pointing forward. It was promised, starting in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, where he said to the woman, the seed of woman will crush the head of the serpent. The first promise of a savior coming to deal with the sin issue was in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. All the prophets in the Holy Scriptures up to this point were pointing forward, and the promises are about the good news, that gospel that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. It's that same good news that he prof that was promised. It's on, tell us if I can get to leave it now. Uh, It's the good news about Jesus Christ. It isn't about somebody else. It isn't about the multiple ways to heaven. It's about the Son. Well, who's the Son? Concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Well, who is this son? Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Matthew 16, 16, Jesus said to Peter, who do men say that I am? Peter, they, to his disciples, they answered, some say Elijah, and some say one of the prophets, and some so forth. <clears throat> John the Baptist, come back to life. Jesus said, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Christ. Those words are interchangeable. They're just the Greek word and the Hebrew word. I, I actually like the Holman that actually puts Messiah in there. <clears throat> it, it helps me remember that. 
You are the Messiah, the Anointed One, the One sent from God, the Son of the Living God. Well, what's a son? Growing up <clears throat> with my dad being a pastor, as I went into the ministry, my preaching style mirrored, mirrored his at the beginning much more than it even does now. I've developed my own style at the time. <coughs> <coughs> Lee, water please, or somebody get me water out of that refrigerator. Um, I'm having a throat issue. Linda's got it. And often it was said of me, he is his father's son. He's just like his dad. What's that mean? Uh, I'm, of course I'm, I'm my father's son, but what are they trying to say? That how I act and my behaviors and how I preach, whatever it was, is mirrors my father's very closely. I like to say that to be declared the son means to be of the same stuff as the father. To be equal to, with the same authority as the father. <clears throat> John 1, <clears throat> I'll get it. John 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, face to face. Interesting, if I can give it to you in Greek. In the beginning was the word. In our in archaic beginning, Heha Logos was the word. Halagos, cross ton feon. The word was face to face with the God. Interesting, there's an article in front of God. What does that mean? It's talking about the Father. Whenever there's an article in front of God like that, it's the specific person of the Godhead. Here it's the Father. And then it says, and the word was God, only in the Greek it says, and God was the word. What's that mean? It means everything that it means to be God, just like the God, the Father, so the Son is the same. He's God. Everything that it means to be God. Of course, our friends and Jehovah's Witnesses want to make that a little g God. You know, a created being. No, he's the same as the Father. Separate in personality, the same in essence. Wrap your head around that, and I'll give you a gold star. I've spent 30 years plus of study trying to wrap my head around that concept of the Trinity, where God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are of one essence, three persons. I don't totally understand it. It's okay. The only thing that's close, in my opinion, <clears throat> is that we are of three, we're of three parts, God the Father, God the Father, God, three parts body, soul, and spirit, but they're very distinct, but they're all me. So maybe that's the closest. I don't like the apple. I don't like a lot of other things that people use to try to explain it. He also said in John 10, I and my father are one. So as we think about concerning his son, I want you to have this idea that here, Paul is saying to the Romans, that this is about the Son of God who is equal to God the Father. And he's our Lord. He's our Master. He just said he was the bond slave of Christ. And here he's saying, listen, he's our Lord. According, uh, But he goes on. He talks about the two natures here of Christ. Who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. The first nature is his human nature. And that human nature was born of the seed of David. Mary and Joseph both, but specifically Mary, um, was a daughter of the house of David. Giving him, and with his adopted daddy uh, Joseph, giving him the right to rule on the throne of David. This is really key in understanding who Jesus Christ is. Because the Messiah, if he's the Messiah, he has to rule on David's throne. Because, remember, this was prophesied. He has to rule on David's throne. So according to the flesh, human, his human nature speaking, he is our Lord who was born of the seed of David. Then he goes on to say, and he was declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection declared something. By him being raised, it was declared for him to be the 
and this is actually a better better way of understanding this in the Greek, <coughs> the powerful Son of God. In his divine nature, the resurrection proved beyond doubt. Nobody raised him from the dead. Jesus raised a lot of people from the dead. Prophets raised people from the dead. We had that going on back then, right? Don't ask me to raise somebody from the dead. They'll still be dead. The resurrection, Jesus raised from the dead without any other intervention, declared him, because he was raised, declared him to be the powerful son of God, divine in nature. His spirit was one of, the, of holiness. Holiness is in opposition to flesh. You have flesh and you have spirit. The spirit of, of Christ, the second nature within him, 100%, 100 man, 100% God, one of flesh, one of spirit, Hear the son of David, hear the son of God. Isn't that neat? All right there. And just read over it too quick sometimes. So G Paul says this gospel is rooted in the dual nature of Christ. Without his dual nature, which by the way, liberal churches deny. They want to erase this part. They want to erase the fact that he's the, the, the divine son of God, that he was the creator, that he is deity. They want to say, this isn't true. He was just a good man. Without this, there is no gospel. But guess what? Without this, there is no gospel. Only a man could save mankind. Only another human being could take the punishment for human beings. It cannot be an angel or even God appearing to be in the flesh he must be born in the flesh to satisfy the wrath of god and the penalty of death but he also had to be perfect in his nature and therefore he had to be the powerful son of god and that was declared or proven beyond doubt by the resurrection <clears throat> this same jesus who the gospel's about put this calling on paul's life then through him we have Received grace and apostleship. This is talking about Paul, not this is a this is the uh, royal we. Paul's talking about himself in the plural. Okay, he's not talking about you and I. We don't have apostleship. He he's talking about his official role as an apostle, which was an office that no longer exists within the church. By through him, Jesus Christ, this special man that has two natures, that is God and man at the same time. We have received grace. Salvation, amen, and apostleship, authority. Salvation and authority, what to, to do what? To bring obedience to faith among all the nations, the Gentiles, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. They're called to salvation, receiving the same grace. Who's the nations? These are the Gentiles that Paul was called to. And what is he doing it for? Not for Paul's name. Not for anybody else's name, but for the name of Jesus Christ. Paul was appointed an apostle in order that through his ministry there might be brought about an obedience which springs from faith or an obedience for the, of, to the faith among the Gentiles, according to least. Interesting, there's a little nuance there. I'm not going to go into it a lot. Jesse and I have been discussing this at some length, um, whether faith is obedience or faith brings obedience. Um, interesting. I, I hold that faith brings obedience, not that faith is obedience. That's a, that one's free. <laughs> you want to discuss that further? We need to get into some deep. <clears throat> Paul continues, and, and we'll just wrap it up here with his message, the, the beginning of his message to the Romans, his salutation to all who were in Rome, all who, he's, he's writing to the believers, okay? To all believers who, how do we know that? Because they're called to be saints. All the ones in Rome that are called to be saints. Now, I know that um, the Catholic Church is about to declare Mother Teresa a saint. I'm not even sure Mother Teresa was saved. I don't know. 
she did a lot of good works, and if that was the way, if that was the means for her salvation, she ain't going to be in heaven. Amen? How is somebody saved? By grace through faith, not by doing a lot of good works. So I don't know if Mother Teresa is going to be in heaven. If it's just by good works, she's not going to be there. I didn't know the lady, so. But who are the saints? Is it something the church declares? Or something God declares? God declares Vinny as a saint. The moment God graced Vinny with salvation. The moment you're saved, you are a saint. It simply means set apart one. You are set apart for his work. We're saved unto good works. Amen? We're not saved by good works. We're saved to do good works. We're saved separated. That's all it means. So Paul is writing, and this taints the whole book of Romans. This, this, this verse right here should help us understand the rest of the whole book. Because who's he writing to? Saints. Christians. Everything in the book is, about, is written to Christians. So if he's talking about unbelievers, he's wanting Christians to understand about unbelievers. If he's talking about the, the way that salvation works, he wants Christians to understand the way salvation works. If he's talking about depravity, of the, the fact that, Christ, that the unsaved world is held accountable by, by nature, this is in next week's message. Romans 1 continue, goes on by saying how you know, the, there's no excuses. He's telling you that, the saints. Okay? Why doesn't he write it to the unsaved? Well, the Bible says that the unsaved can't understand the things of God. In fact, Paul says that too here in the book of Romans. He talks about the fact that no one in their own nature seeks after God. So, so it's written to the saints. What's he say? Grace to you. Grace receiving what we cannot own. To you in peace. Peace is the cessation of hostility between us and God. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. We desire nothing more than grace and peace in our lives. Amen? Amen? If we receive grace from God, that which we don't deserve, and he showers us with peace, now that doesn't mean an easy life. We don't mean peace on earth. We mean peace with God. Amen. Yeah. What more is there for a Christian to ask for? So my question is for you. Is first of all, are you a saint at Tracy, California? Do you know Jesus Christ? I look around this room and I think everybody in here, I've either baptized or I know for sure has given a, a clear testimony of salvation. Praise God. Have you been obedient to the faith because of the preaching of the gospel? And are you obedient to share that same gospel? That's the power of God into salvation. The theme in this book is found in verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God for salvation or to salvation for everyone who believes for the Jew first. Are we hiding? Or are we bold? Are we ashamed? Or are we unashamed? Father God, help us to not be ashamed of your word, your gospel. Help us to fulfill the calling you placed on each of our lives because we've been set aside, sanctified, made saints with the commission making disciples and spreading the, spreading the gospel, the good news. Father, it's good news. Help us to be excited about sharing so that other people can see. I thank you for how you're working in lives and we pray that you will continue to bless Crossroads, our future, what you have for us, we don't know. But we know, Father, that you have a perfect will in these things. And we look forward to seeing what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing that same song.